uh, thanks for coming out, everybody, and uh, thanks to all you people on the internet live streaming this talk right now. Uh, my name is Charles Bangley, but you can call me Chuck. Um, I'm a PhD candidate at East Carolina University in the Coastal Resources Management Program. And uh, finally, thanks a lot to the UNC Coastal Studies Institute for inviting me out to talk to you guys today. So before I talk about sharks, um, I'm going to talk about North Carolina in general for a little bit. Um, our waters are actually interesting enough that there are entire uh, wings of science that are devoted to studying just the water. Those scientists could really uh, not care less about all the fish and stuff in there. Um, but it's, all our currents are still interesting enough. North Carolina, specifically Cape Hatteras right here, uh, sits at the confluence of two major ocean currents. The Labrador Current coming down from the north here in ECU Purple. Um, and then the Gulf Stream coming up from the tropics here in NC State Red. And then UNC is kind of wedged in here somewhere. Um, and uh, what that creates is actually a dividing line between two major ocean ecosystems, the kind of temperate waters to the north um, and then the subtropical waters to the south. And this makes uh, for some highly productive uh, marine environments here in North Carolina. Once you move inside the Sound, Pamlico Sound is also a very, very unique ecosystem. Um, it's the second largest estuarine system in the continental US, and it's also the largest lagoon in the United States. Um, it's a lagoon in as much as it's only connected to the ocean through three tiny little inlets, Ocracoke, Hatteras, and Oregon Inlet up here. Um, it's also got these extensive fringing seagrass beds along the back sides of the barrier islands, and for the most part, the system is fairly shallow and uh, very influenced by freshwater inflow from these rivers down here, the Noose and the Pamlico. So as long as people have been exploring North Carolina's waters, they've actually been noticing that we have some uh, what have since then become very famous residents. Um, this is an etching from back in the colonial era showing uh, or purporting to show the, um, the Native American fishing techniques around Roanoke Island. Uh, what you can see down here that I've kind of defaced this priceless piece of art to show you is a, uh, what looks like a bonnet head shark. Um, so even back in the colonial era, they were recognizing that sharks were not only in North Carolina waters, but occasionally entered the estuaries. And since then, the technology has improved, but the sharks have not necessarily left. Um, these are the locations of pop-up satellite tags that were deployed in Chesapeake Bay. These were on sandbar sharks. Um, and just about all of them moved down to this area off of the North Carolina coast, where the tags popped up and transmitted data. Um, even more recently, these are two tracks from satellite tag Great White Sharks, tagged by a group called OSEARCH. Um, and both of these sharks not only came into North Carolina waters, they actually seem to have entered Pamlico Sound. This one, Catherine here, went so far in that even with the margin of error on these satellite tags, it's kind of impossible that she wasn't in there. And then earlier this month, this red dot actually represents another shark named Jeannie, um, who looks like she came in around the Stumpy Point area. Um, back in 2012, there was another white shark, Mary Lee, that seemed to actually go into Ocracoke Inlet, go behind Ocracoke, and then come back out Hatteras Inlet. So why care about sharks? They're certainly not the most high value species in our fisheries here in North Carolina, but they do have some importance, uh, aside from just being really cool subjects for nature documentaries. Um, they do support commercial and recreational fisheries. The recreational sector for sharks is actually growing here in our state. Um, and the commercial sector actually, uh, commercial fishermen actually use sharks as kind of a, um, a way to get through lean times, especially the dogfish fisheries. These are the species that our local fishermen fish on while they wait for the higher value species to show up. So shark fisheries in North Carolina actually have a, uh, a societal value that goes a little bit beyond just their market price. Um, some of our local species are also uh, subject to conservation concerns. There are several species that are common here off of North Carolina that have recently been petitioned to be added to the Endangered Species Act. Um, their interactions with other species can also be important. These are you know, often large apex predators. Um, they can impact the populations of their prey, and they can also impact, perhaps more importantly, the behavior of their prey. Um, and these interactions can have cascading effects that affect things all the way down to how well the seagrass grows. And finally, being apex predators, they're both indicators and promoters of ecosystem health. Through those cascading effects, they can actually make life better for some of their non-prey species in the area. Um, and the presence of an apex predator like a shark also suggests that the uh, local habitat is of high quality. They're not going to be there if there's not a good prey base and if the abiotic factors aren't favorable. In North Carolina, we've uh, had a few recent issues uh, related to sharks that have come up. This circled area right here is the uh, 
the bottom long line closed area. This area is closed from January 1st to the end of July every year, primarily to protect um, what's believed to be nursery habitat for sandbar and dusky sharks. Um, and speaking of the sandbar and dusky sharks, these are two species that uh, have been caught in relatively high numbers, especially juveniles here off of North Carolina. Um, the sandbar shark is actually, uh, can only be fished as part of a limited access research fishery due to concerns over its uh, populations, um, but there are some signs those populations are actually rebuilding. The same actually happened with the dusky shark, uh, which actually just this past year was petitioned to be listed on the Endangered Species Act. In the process of going over whether or not that species needed to be listed, uh, the assessment found that there were actually signs of life in the dusky shark population. Some of these dusky sharks are actually uh, rebounding. So they didn't need to be listed on the Endangered Species Act, and that's great news for the sharks and also good news for those of us who fish around here. Um, and then finally, the scalloped hammerhead. Some populations of the species did actually get listed on the Endangered Species Act, but not our population here off of North Carolina. So my research aims to, uh, to understand how sharks are using habitat here in the state's waters um, on both sides of the barrier islands, both on the near shore kind of oceanic side and also inside the estuaries. Um, and also to use that information to describe interactions between sharks and other species and also between the sharks themselves. Um, this should provide baseline data to help with fisheries management um, and also give an idea of the ecosystem role of some of these species, especially as managers try to move towards a more ecosystem-based uh, management strategy. So I want to start out by looking at things on a coastal scale, uh, looking at uh, what sharks are using our nearshore waters off in North Carolina, where they're coming from, and where they're going. So in order to do this, uh, we worked with a commercial fisherman out of Hatteras, Chris Hickman. Um, he actually brought us to some really great spots to find sharks, so uh, big thanks to him for helping out this research. And we basically surgically tagged um, mostly juvenile sandbar sharks. You can see the procedure being done by my former lab mate, Andrea Delapa here, um, with acoustic pinger tags. So these tags transmit an acoustic signal that has a unique ID number. Uh, and when a shark swims within, I've actually got the next slide on that. When a shark swims within a range of a receiver, usually a Vemco VR2W like this one, um, and this is actually false advertising, we didn't actually tag any hammerheads. Um, and when it swims within detection range of a receiver, it uh, sends out that ID number, the receiver records that. Some of the tags we use also send out a signal showing the local temperature um, and the local depth, so we can get a little bit of habitat use data out of those sharks when they're within detection range. Um, for our part, we set up an acoustic listening fence off of Hatteras, North Carolina. Um, it went out to about 12 miles out. We spaced the receivers approximately a mile apart, or 1.6 kilometers. Um, through some range testing, we found that the uh, detection range on these receivers out there in that part of the ocean was about 800 meters. So the edge of the detection range of one receiver tended to end or overlap only a little bit with the next receiver's detection range. Um, we also partnered up with a group called the Atlantic Cooperative Telemetry Network, uh, which is based out of Delaware State, and basically coordinates all of these researchers' acoustic arrays up and down the U.S. East Coast. Uh, they also worked with the Florida uh, Atlantic Cooperative Telemetry Network, these ones down here in purple. Um, and with that, we're actually able to tell where our sharks go once they leave the state's waters, which has given us some incredibly uh, interesting information. Um, so while we were out there fishing for sharks, these are sharks we encountered but did not necessarily tag. Um, we found plenty of Atlantic sharp-nosed sharks, uh, smooth dogfish, which are very prevalent here in the North Carolina coast, um, angel sharks, interestingly enough, we found quite a few of those. Um, one large scalloped hammerhead, so far at about six and a half feet long, that's the largest shark that I've personally had to handle out of gear. Um, plenty of spiny dogfish, particularly in the colder months, and then a few of these uh, juvenile common thresher sharks as well. The sharks we actually did tag included two dusky sharks. Uh, we caught three total, tagged two of them, um, and then never heard from them again. So, uh, and that's a little bit frustrating for me because I actually did injure myself tagging one of these sharks. Um, so they're still out there, hopefully, fingers crossed, uh, that someday they'll cross in an acoustic array somewhere and get picked up. Um, actually, the movements of juvenile dusky sharks are really not well understood. So basically, whenever we hear anything from, uh, from these two sharks, if we hear anything from these two sharks, it'll be fairly new information. Sandbar sharks, we had a lot more luck, uh, both catching and tagging. Uh, we captured 196, uh, all of them within one day. Uh, 
So you can get into huge aggregations of sandbar sharks, especially around uh, just south of Cape Hatteras. Um, all of the sharks represent were juveniles representing ages from zero to two. And then this is actually a, a histogram showing the length distribution. So you can see that um, the lengths really kind of skew towards the upper end of each age range. So what that's telling us is that North Carolina is not a primary nursery. These sharks more than likely aren't born in the area, but they are migrating here from where they were born. Um, and this is a major overwintering area for this species. Um, we, ended up cap we ended up tagging 15 of these sharks, um, all of them juvenile size, and we heard from 12 of them, which actually gives us around an 80% redetection rate, uh, which is much higher than you get with conventional tagging. Um, another benefit is that we keep hearing from these sharks as long as they're out there and their tags are still working or they're still alive. Um, so for several of these sharks, we actually have multiple years worth of redetection data here. Um, most of them actually uh, originated in Chesapeake Bay. So here in purple, we have the, uh, the sharks when they were detected off of our Hatteras array. In red uh, is when they show up in the, the array maintained by the US Navy off of Chesapeake Bay. Um, and then these blue dots here are actually the, uh, the Delaware Bay Array, maintained by Delaware State. Um, these orange ones are actually an interesting story. Those are transceivers attached to a, uh, a sand tiger shark. Um, so some researchers out of Delaware State and University of Delaware actually tag sand tiger sharks and use them as mobile acoustic arrays. Um, so these, uh, these sandbar sharks were actually picked up by a passing sand tiger. And, uh, Judging by the fact that we heard from them again later, they got out of there. Sand tigers are known to be a predator of juvenile sandbar sharks. Um, speaking of predation, this is a bit of an unusual movement right here. Um, so this, uh, this ends in actually a gray circle that you may or may not be able to see well from, the, from back in here in the room. Um, that gray circle is actually from the Hudson River. So the last detection for this shark was pretty much right next to Manhattan. Um, this shark went into uh, to Chesapeake Bay around the same time frame as the rest of them. Um, and then all of a sudden shot up to Delaware Bay. And then within a few weeks later, shot up to uh, another acoustic array maintained at the mouth of the uh, Hudson River. Um, generally, when you have one individual shark that suddenly starts showing dramatically different behavior than the rest of them, but still has kind of a consistent movement pattern, uh, that means it was eaten by something. So this, uh, this particular transmitter here was likely transmitting from inside something else's stomach um, after it left the Chesapeake Bay. Uh, comparing notes with some other people who have been out tagging sharks, it looks like the likely culprit was probably a sand tiger. So it's a good thing those other sharks that were detected by the sand tiger carrying the, uh, the acoustic receiver got away. Um, another interesting uh, development is um, you know, most of these ended up going into the Chesapeake Bay. Uh, one of them did spend quite a bit of time in the Delaware Bay. Um, there's this, you'll see this gap here among the sharks that are in the Chesapeake Bay. And uh, for a while, I didn't really understand what was going on there. I thought maybe they were leaving the Chesapeake Bay, going out to Delaware, but then they wouldn't show up in Delaware. Um, what had actually happened was, after conversing with a fisherman who works in the Chesapeake Bay, the Chesapeake Bay acoustic fence only covers the area around the mouth and up into the James River. Um, if the sharks move north farther up into the bay, uh, they actually move out of detection range. And that's exactly what was happening here is all the tag sharks were actually going farther up behind the eastern shore of Virginia and moving out of detection range. Something I would not have known had I not uh, talked to a fisherman. So that'll be the first time I bring up the important point of talking to fishermen today. Um, another interesting development is we had a few sharks that only showed up in the Hatteras array and one of them actually came back. And there's actually very good acoustic array coverage uh, north of North Carolina. So pretty much if a shark moves north, we're going to pick it up either as it passes by the Chesapeake Bay or as it goes farther north into Delaware or even Massachusetts waters. Um, what there wasn't great coverage of uh, was areas south of North Carolina. Um, so until about the past year or so, um, there haven't been acoustic arrays in South Carolina, not really in Georgia. There was one kind of offshore on Gray's Reef. Um, and you didn't really get these nice extensive inshore arrays until you got into the Cape Canaveral area in Florida. Um, so there's the possibility that these sharks that only ever showed up in Hatteras actually went somewhere else. Um, and because the juvenile sandbar sharks tend to hug the coast, my own personal hypothesis is that they actually move south. Uh, they actually either move somewhere farther south along um, the North Carolina coast or they moved into uh, Charleston Harbor and other areas of South Carolina that are known to be sandbar shark nurseries. Um, and then 108.27 down here, we ended up naming this shark Bias. 
The reason for that is because this shark actually didn't really go up into the Chesapeake Bay as much and hung out around the James River right in the middle of the, uh, the Chesapeake Bay array. Because of that, she actually accounts for over 57% of our detections. Um, so that's bias, folks. Oh, these, are the, uh, these are marking the ones that only showed up in Hatteras. Um, you'll also notice that uh, in that, uh, that little schematic before, um, in the second year of detections of Hatteras, we only had a handful of detections in our array. That's because in the second year, our receivers started looking like this. Um, we actually had to send divers down for these things. Um, there were a succession of storms, one of which was Hurricane Sandy. Um, and there was also a succession of nor'easters that kept us from going out to retrieve our acoustic receivers for over six months. Um, so because Hatteras is a pretty choppy bit of water, um, we actually had a hard time getting to our gear and maintaining it, uh, probably as often as it needed to be. So there are still some of these acoustic receivers out there. So if you guys are combing the beach at some point and see something that kind of looks like that or may even look worse at this point, um, let me know because we might still be able to salvage the data from it. Um, so this is where our sharks showed up. So down here you have the, uh, the detections down here off of Cape Hatteras, and then this blob right here is the, uh, pretty much the entire Chesapeake Bay array, and then you have some up here in Delaware Bay, and New Jersey maintains some receivers offshore here as well. Um, what I'm going to show you is a little animation basically showing a year in the life of an average juvenile sandbar shark as detected by acoustic receivers. Um, so in February they're hanging out around Cape Hatteras, in March, they're still milling around Cape Hatteras. And then by mid-April, they start to leave Cape Hatteras, but there are still some stragglers that are hanging out um, around here in the overwintering grounds. Uh, what we found was by April 21st, we were no longer detecting any sandbar sharks um, off, of the ha off of Hatteras. Um, starting in, uh, in mid-May, they start to show up in what we believe to be their original primary nurseries, the places where they were born and migrated to Hatteras from. Um, and you'll see early on they're showing up mostly in the mouths of these estuaries. So they're starting to round uh, um, Cape Henlopen over here, trying to, starting to get into the Chesapeake Bay. Um, in June, a lot of them are still making their way in. They're kind of feeling out these estuaries. Um, there are some that are uh, getting in around the Chesapeake Bay Bridge Tunnel. Um, and then by July, they're starting to move up into the estuaries. If you pay attention to this Delaware Bay one, um, it actually makes a really interesting circle around Delaware Bay over the course of uh, the summer. Um, and then we have some sharks going into the James River here too. You'll notice we don't have a whole ton of detections in the Chesapeake Bay. That's because this is the time of year that the sharks are actually moving north up uh, behind the eastern shore. Um, by August, they're milling about all over the, uh, the estuaries. September, they're actually starting to cluster up around the, uh, the mouth of the Chesapeake Bay, and they're starting to make their way back down uh, towards Cape Henlopen in Delaware. Um, by uh, October, there are none left in uh, Delaware Bay, and they're actually starting to leave Chesapeake Bay and getting detected on these, uh, these offshore receivers just outside the bay. And finally, by December, um, they're all coming back to Hatteras. So we're able to make a few preliminary conclusions from this, um, and actually all of the, uh, the acoustic tags we deployed on the sandbar sharks are due, were, or were due to expire uh, this past January. Um, so we probably have about as much data as we're going to get out of these sharks now. Um, what we can say is that we have connections between Hatteras and multiple primary nurseries, and even potentially southern nurseries, or maybe inside Pamlico Sound. Um, and uh, all of these sharks, uh, I want to reiterate, were caught in pretty much the same area on exactly the same day. So we have sharks from two different primary nurseries that are coming to Cape Hatteras, interacting with each other, um, and it's showing us that Cape Hatteras actually functions as a pretty good mixing ground for multiple populations of sandbar sharks. Um, so we have some future directions. There are still some tag sharks out there. This past January, uh, I tagged three sandbar sharks on the, uh, the Cooperative Winter Tagging Cruise. Um, which uh, was primarily looking for striped bass, but uh, we managed to catch some sandbar sharks too. And uh, to pat myself on the back, they were the first sandbar sharks in the 25 year history of the cruise that have ever been caught. Um, and they, uh, they pretty much run the gamut of size ranges. We have one male that's within young of year size range, one male that's probably about one, two years old, and then a female that's the largest sandbar shark I've tagged so far. Um, and she's actually probably a year or two away from uh, being mature. So we might actually see her movements change as she grows. Um, so that'll be really fun to, uh, to find out. Um, our acoustic array, sadly, is no longer off of Hatteras. 
uh, but now we're going to try to chase sharks around with a mobile acoustic array. Um, so this is our wave glider. Uh, ECU just recently purchased this piece of equipment with NSF funding from Liquid Robotics. Um, this goofy looking thing, it looks like a surfboard with, a, uh, um, with an antenna and a solar array on the top of it. And then if you look at it underneath the water, it looks even weirder. Um, this is actually powered by a combination of solar and wave energy. Uh, so this piece of equipment is actually going to run transects off of North Carolina. It's carrying a, uh, an acoustic receiver with it. Um, and it's basically going to see whether or not it picks up any more tagged fish. Aside from our sharks, there are also uh, sturgeon, white sharks, other species of sharks out there, sea turtles. We picked up a few marine mammals. Um, so this is going to be a big help not only to us, but also to other researchers uh, deploying these acoustic tags up and down the coast. So now I'm going to zero in on the estuary. Uh, we're going to move inside the inlets and look at Pamlico Sound. And uh, a lot of this would not be possible without help from North Carolina DMF. So I just want to take this time to thank them for data sharing with me. Um, so it's well known that sharks use estuaries as nursery habitat, although uh, their use of a habitat, especially a lagoonal habitat like Pamlico Sound, is not quite as well known. Um, so to look at that, North Carolina DMF actually has pretty extensive coverage of just about the entire perimeter of the sound between their independent gillnet surveys and also their, uh, their longline survey. Now there are some differences between these surveys. The, uh, the longline survey only runs from July to uh, November. Um, where the gillnet survey runs almost year round. They take January off. Um, but between those two surveys, we do get pretty good coverage and there is some overlap as well. Um, so I looked at the survey years from 2007 to 2013 um, and looked at these environmental factors, depth, temperature, dissolved oxygen, and salinity, and then went into uh, ArcGIS to actually measure the distance from each sampling station to the nearest inlet and also the distance to the nearest uh, SAV bed. Um, the SAV beds are actually from data collected by the Albemarle Pamlico National Estuarium Program, or APNEP. They actually generated a nice GIS layer mapping a lot of these seagrass beds uh, out here next to the, um, the outer banks, and also some of the other SAV beds, including things like milfoil and other types of SAV that are farther up in the brackish and fresh part of the river. Um, so the, uh, the first thing I did was actually map the, um, the habitat factors across the entirety of Pamlico Sound um, using, a, uh, using a function called Bayesian Empirical Krieging. Um, I'm not really an expert in that, but uh, it gave us the lowest error. Uh, so that's what we used. Um, so uh, this is what salinity looked like, um, dissolved oxygen. And this is actually what the distance from the seagrass bed layer looked like. So the more green it is, the, uh, the, more, the closer it is to a seagrass bed. So these darker green areas are actually inside seagrass habitats. Uh, the same with the, uh, the distance from the inlet. Um, for the highly variable environmental factors like salinity, dissolved oxygen, and temperature, we actually made a separate layer for each season. Um, and to go even a step beyond that, because you can have very different conditions in early spring and late spring um, in the same situation with the fall, we actually use six seasons, splitting spring and fall into early and late. Um, the next thing we did, and uh, sorry to bore you guys with some of the math, um, we used generalized linear models uh, with a bimodal distribution. Um, the more academic people in the audience will ask me about these things. Um, to look at basically what the shark presence or absence versus the different environmental factors. Um, we then use uh, correlation and regression tree models to basically ask a yes-no question um, to kind of split the environmental factors into ranges where there are low shark catches and ranges where there are high shark catches. And the outputs actually looked a little bit like this, um, like this kind of tree here. So what this is telling us is that you know, only 1% of the, uh, the stations where sharks were caught were in salinity less than 20, where over 70% of them were in stations with salinity greater than 20 parts per thousand. Um, and then finally, we, uh, we used ArcGIS to literally color in the parts of the map um, that fit within those environmental ranges where sharks were actually captured, or were at least likely to be captured. Um, so first off, we have to look at how many sharks we actually caught between these surveys. Uh, there were uh, over 2,200 sharks caught uh, total. Um, and the vast majority of them were actually smooth dogfish, particularly in the gillnet survey. There were 1,545 smooth dogfish captured in the gillnet survey. So we have excellent data on those. Um, otherwise, a shark was considered common if we caught more than 30 of them. Um, so using that criteria, uh, the sandbar shark, and this is the total between the surveys, 
The sandbar shark, um, the smooth dogfish, the spiny dogfish, the bull shark, the black tip, and the Atlantic sharp nose shark were the species that we termed the principal species, uh, mostly because we had enough of them to do more math on. Um, and uh, those are going to be the ones that we're going to do further analysis on as we move through this talk. Uh, but we did get some oddballs. Um, there were actually a couple sand tiger sharks caught, scalloped hammerhead, spinner sharks, um, and a few bonnethead sharks that are almost reaching the point where we could do some extra stats on them. Um, so breaking the shark catches down by season, we see that uh, some species definitely split out. Um, the spiny dogfish here in purple is, a, uh, is a very much a winter species. They're pretty much gone by the time the waters warm up. Um, the smooth dogfish was our only species that showed up year round. There was at least one caught in every season. Uh, but they really peaked in late spring and summer. Um, and the vast majority of these sharks, particularly the gillnet caught ones, um, were actually juveniles. They were sharks that fell within the size ranges of uh, being one or two years old or even neonates, sharks that had been born that year. Um, most of our shark species showed up in the summer. Uh, the black tip sharks and the bull sharks pretty much only showed up in the summer. And the Atlantic sharp nose sharks stuck around until the, uh, the early fall. Um, interestingly, sandbar sharks were almost a fall specialist. Uh, there are a couple that show up in the early spring as well. But this makes sense given that our tagging data showed that these, this species tends to overwinter off of North Carolina and more or less leave um, once the waters warm up. Um, so this kind of complicated table is basically just to show you, A, what my color scheme is going to be going forward. Uh, so sharp nose will be in green, black tip will be in black. Bull will be in red, sandbar in brown, smooth dogfish in, uh, in blue, and spiny dogfish in ECU purple, because that's the shark that I got my start on. Um, so these are the, uh, the kind of mean habitat ranges that the, uh, that the sharks fell out in. Um, and those marked with an asterisk are ones that the generalized linear models actually showed a significant relationship with the shark presence. Um, so the ones marked with an asterisk uh, statistically actually matter in determining whether or not a shark is going to choose that habitat. Um, the ones that are underlined are the ones that we actually fed into the CART models. And the reason why you have some that are underlined and some that aren't, even though they're both significant, is that we found that dissolved oxygen in temperature and also inlet distance and salinity um, were highly autocorrelated. So those two, those pairs of environmental factors tended to vary the same way um, all the time. So if you had high temperature, you had low DO. Um, and if you had, obviously, a closer distance or a le less distance from the inlet, um, you had higher salinity. So because those factors were so correlated with each other, um, if given a choice between the two of them, we picked the one that was more significant to actually run into the model. Um, so these are, I'm basically just going to run species by species through the results. Um, so this is the Atlantic sharp nose shark. It's a, uh, it's a cute little species, maxes out at about three, four feet long. Um, it's one of the more common coastal sharks here in North Carolina. Um, these dots right here are where the sharks were actually captured in the long line and gillnet surveys. And then um, the CART model told us that the, uh, we would expect to find sharp nose sharks less than about 14 kilometers from the inlet um, and at temperatures greater than 18.3 degrees Celsius. Uh, because these sharks were about evenly uh, abundant um, between early fall and the summer, we modeled habitat for both of them. And the summer habitat more or less covers up the, uh, the early fall habitat, um, except for a couple little spots where, there, where the sharks are not there in the fall. Um, but uh, the way we kind of validated this was by going back into the shark catches and seeing how many of them actually fell into uh, what we projected the habitat would be. And the sharp nose shark worked pretty well. 85.1% of the catches fell into what we projected as the habitat area. Um, the black tip shark worked even better, 95.8% of them fell in there. Uh, part of that is because it came back with a pretty big habitat area. But much like the sharp nose shark, it likes to be a certain distance from the inlet and really no farther. Um, and the black tip shark actually likes warmer temperatures. It prefers temperatures above close to 26 degrees Celsius. This makes sense for a shark that's typically found near shore, more so than in estuaries, um, and also tends to only be around in the Pamlico Sound area in the summer. Um, the bull shark was a really interesting one. Um, so the bull shark likes warmer temperatures. Uh, it was only really found in temperatures above 22.8 degrees Celsius. Um, and it actually had both a minimum and maximum uh, salinity for us. So the bull sharks like to be in this mid-range area where the salinity was, uh, was less than 23.7 degrees Celsius, so not really ocean water salinity, but not quite into the brackish area either. So it liked being far from the inlets, uh, 
but up into the, not too far up into the rivers. And we did have a few random catches up in the Noose River, uh, some that you know, were kind of around the mouth of the Pamlico River, but the vast majority were actually in this little zone right here. And this is Longshoal River. Um, it kind of sits at the dividing line between Dare and Hyde County, and pretty much all the land around it is encompassed within um, the Alligator River Wildlife Refuge. So this is pretty much the middle of nowhere out here. Um, and then this here, where you have another couple of big dots, is Englehard Bay. Uh, there is a fishing community there, um, but as far as human habitation goes, it's not huge. It's not like these sharks are interacting with a major city. Um, so it is interesting that the bull sharks tend to be in places where the people really aren't. Um, oh, and, the, and this one worked pretty well. Over 70% of the, uh, the catches fell within the habitat area. The sandbar shark probably had the coolest looking one, um, one that didn't perform particularly well if you look just at whether or not the catches fell exactly within the habitat area. Only 13% fell exactly within. But if we gave the, uh, the habitat area a buffer of about a kilometer, 60% um, of the, uh, the sandbar shark catches fell within there. That's because sandbar sharks liked depth. Um, they preferred waters that were over 1.1 meter in depth. And anyone who's tried to go through these inlets here can tell you that the, uh, the USGS um, depth layer that we used in, uh, in GIS is probably not accurate even week to week, let alone in the years since the USGS has uh, last put that out. Um, so these little, uh, these little channels right here in uh, Ogre Coke, Oregon, and, uh, and Hatteras Inlets are probably whipping around all the time. Every time the surveys are out there, the depth is probably a little bit different. Um, so that's why we place that buffer on the, uh, on the sandbar shark habitat, because depth, particularly around these inlets, can be highly variable. Um, sandbar sharks also pre preferred higher salinities, preferring salinities over about 23 parts per thousand. Again, this is primarily a marine species comes into the, uh, the estuary is probably chasing food. Um, the smooth dogfish shark, or the smooth hound, as uh, NIMS is now calling them. As you can see, I'm still getting used to it because one map says smooth dogfish and the other one says smooth hound. Um, the, uh, the smooth dogfish were actually the only shark that showed a really strong connection with SAV beds. Um, so for whatever reason, this shark was caught almost exclusively along the backside of the barrier islands, and most of these stations were actually inside a seagrass bed. Um, so just about all the smooth, uh, smooth hound sharks were caught within uh, 273 meters of a, uh, a seagrass bed. So they were maybe two and a half football fields away from seagrass at any given time when they were captured in these surveys. Um, they also preferred temperatures over 13.15 degrees Celsius. This is a species that was around year round, but doesn't seem to like the really depth of winter temperatures when it gets down into the single digits. Um, so this was interesting. Again, most of these sharks were actually uh, young of year or juveniles. So there's a possibility that smoothhound sharks are actually using the seagrass beds behind the outer banks as a nursery habitat. Um, and judging from the sheer number of them caught, uh, probably a pretty important one. Um, and then finally, my old friend, the spiny dogfish. This one looks so thrilled to be participating in this survey. Um, again, a species that, caught, that was caught primarily on the backside of the barrier islands. Um, it, uh, also it also showed inlet distance as an important environmental factor, not really being caught farther than about 20 kilometers from the nearest inlet. And this was a real winter specialist, so it liked lower temperatures than just about all of the other species. Um, so it was primarily caught in temperatures less than uh, a little bit under 16 degrees Celsius, which is not comfortable swimming water. Um, so this complicated looking graph is what's called a uh, discriminant function analysis. The take home message from here is that these little arrays are basically, um, the closer they are to the base of the array is the lower um, that particular environmental measurement is. Um, and then the farther along the, uh, you know, the shark species is along that array, kind of the, uh, the more important that particular uh, habitat factor is to that shark species. So you'll see right now we have the smooth dogfish, the spiny dogfish, and the bull shark um, actually partitioning out from the other three species. And uh, one thing this function actually does do is uh, it basically classifies your species um, by their habitat parameters. So the idea here was to see if uh, we could predict what the shark species was, was, was going to be or what our likely shark species would be if all we did was plug in what the environmental factors were. And it actually correctly identified the shark species almost 80% of the time. Um, so we have some real habitat partitioning going on between some of our shark species. But you'll notice the sandbar, Atlantic sharpnose, and blacktip shark, especially the sharpnose and blacktip, are uh, pretty much right on top of each other right here. 
in this um, kind of higher salinity and lower inlet distance area. And sure enough, um, when we partition these species out by species, uh, or when we partitioned the classifications out by species, we found that bull shark um, was classified correctly over 90% of the time, uh, again, because it had that really specific uh, salinity range. Um, smooth dogfish classified out over 80% of the, correctly 80% of the time. Um, and spiny dogfish classified out even a greater percentage of the, or correctly, even a greater percentage of the time than the bull sharks. These other non-highlighted species, the sandbar, sharpnose, and blacktip, actually had other species that they classified as uh, more often than themselves. Um, so that's telling us that there's quite a bit of overlap going on between these species. Um, a lot of the high overlap is actually with smooth dogfish. That's because there are just so many smooth dogfish in the system. It's probably difficult for a shark to get around without actually running into a smooth dogfish at some point. Um, so one more way to look at this as I throw more math at you. Uh, this is Tukey's honestly significant difference. Basically what this does is it assigns a letter to each shark based on the, uh, based on the ranges they fall within in these environmental factors. And species with the same letter are grouping together. They have similar habitat preferences. Um, and most of our similarity is actually between the Atlantic sharpnose and blacktip sharks, um, particularly in significant factors like dissolved oxygen and distance from inlet. Um, so this is telling us that, uh, that sharpnose sharks and blacktip sharks, as you probably saw from where they uh, ended up coming out in the habitat maps, have quite a bit of habitat overlap. Um, there's a little bit less with the sandbar shark, and the sandbar shark, even though it didn't really classify as itself correctly very often, um, it kind of gets away with using the same habitat range as some of these other species because it's there in the fall, where some of these other species are primarily there in the summer. So it's got a seasonal difference in distribution. Um, these are radar graphs showing how often the sharks were actually caught at the same time. So this is spatial overlap. This is basically in a given gillnet or longline set, how often you would catch a sharp-nosed shark with a smooth dogfish. Um, and you, you can see that even though you know, some of these triangles look pretty big, the maximum amount of overlap that we ever get for any species with another species is 20%. This is not very high. Um, a moderate amount of spatial overlap is considered to be over 40%. Um, anything under that and the amount of overlap is almost ecologically insignificant. Um, so we're seeing that, uh, that sharp-nosed sharks coincide with blacktip sharks quite a bit. Um, just about everything has a fair amount of overlap with smooth dogfish. Um, although there were so many smooth dogfish that they, uh, that species themselves didn't really overlap with much else other than spiny dogs. Um, and generally, just overall, even though you would expect some of these species to have really overlapping ranges within Pamlico Sound, you're not catching them at the same time. So this is suggestive that there's a behavioral difference between several of these species, um, that they're actually kind of avoiding each other. Uh, they don't want to be in the same spot as sharks of other species. Um, and this would make sense, especially for the poor sharp nose here. Um, this is actually the only time sampling I've caught two sharks on one hook. Um, but uh, there's a decent enough size difference between blacktip and, sand, or, and sharp nose sharks that uh, a sh an interaction between the two species is unlikely to work out so well for the sharp nose. Um, so what, uh, what we can kind of conclude from all of this is that uh, you know, temperature, salinity, and distance from the inlet seem to influence the habitat choice for the, uh, the greatest number of species. Um, this makes sense. These are mostly marine species. They're going to go where the salinity is a little bit more similar to uh, what they find in the ocean. And also temperature is going to really drive their seasonal presence. You're either going to be a warm water shark, you're going to be a cooler water shark. Our real habitat specialists were the bull shark, smooth dogfish, and spiny dogfish. Uh, bull shark liked lower salinity um, than most of the other species. Spiny dogfish liked it colder. And then smooth dogfish really separated out by that affinity for, uh, for seagrass habitat. Um, sharp nosed black and sandbar cluster together into this community that seem to like high salinity closer to the inlets. Um, and finally, you know, there's good reason why these sharks don't like to interact with each other. So there was overall uh, pretty low spatial overlap. If you're catching one species, you're unlikely to catch other species. Um, just want to zero in on one species before I finish up, uh, just because this had some of the more interesting um, results. And uh, this also, uh, you may have seen me get covered in the news about some of this stuff. Um, so bear with me. Um, so to give a little bit of historical perspective, uh, Frank Schwartz from the UNC Marine Lab uh, back in 2012 published a, uh, a pretty 
comprehensive overview of bull shark presence and habitat use within North Carolina waters. And he compiled a number of different uh, data sources for this, including uh, DMF, Gillnet, and Hulsane surveys, um, all the way down to even sightings data from fishermen and fishery landings. Um, this circle down here is a very long-term uh, longline survey that he's been running off of Cape Lookout uh, since about the 60s. So all told, his data set went all the way back to 1965, and the last year that he covered was 2011. Uh, what he found is that in that time frame, there were 113 bull sharks captured. Uh, they were potentially caught year-round, but most of them kind of showed up between May and September. Uh, in that entire time frame, um, only nine individuals that he identified as juveniles uh, were actually captured. So from 1965 to 2011, there were only nine small bull sharks uh, that fell within his data set. So he came to the conclusion that North Carolina does not serve as a nursery area for the bull shark. Um, then an interesting, interesting thing happened as I was working with uh, people at DMF going over the Gillnet Longline Survey data. Um, I only went back to 2007 because that's when the Longline Survey started and I wanted to be able to compare apples to apples between the Gillnet and the Longline Surveys. Um, so there were a few bull sharks that uh, didn't really have length recorded. Um, usually this means they busted out of the gear next to the boat. Um, so they probably were fairly decently sized. And then starting in 2011, you start to see juvenile sized bull sharks show up. Um, bull sharks that aren't necessarily newborn sized, but uh, you know, are probably only one, two, maybe three years old. And then 2012, we get this huge spike in, uh, in both juvenile and young of year bull sharks. And some of these were actually um, neonate sized bull sharks. Uh, they were sharks that were the correct size to actually have just come out of their mothers. Um, and more importantly, they're actually showing up at about the same time that bull sharks pop in other nurseries, uh, particularly Indian River Lagoon down in Florida, which right now is recognized as the northernmost bull shark nursery on the East Coast. And bull sharks have actually shown up fairly consistently since 2012. Um, now granted, this is a uh, fairly short-term data set, but it is really interesting that we had almost no bull shark catches prior to 2011, and then they become a regular presence in the survey um, after 2011. And actually, just earlier today, um, I was over at the DMF office looking at some of the older data. And even back to 2001, there are a handful of kind of scattered bull shark catches. Um, and even all of those are not necessarily juveniles. So it's really interesting that all of a sudden we have, boom, there's bull sharks. Um, when these sharks are actually caught, actually corresponds nicely to, when they, uh, to the time frame that they spend in their nursery habitat in other parts of the US East Coast. Um, so again, the same color scheme applies. The, uh, the sharks in black are adults, and the sharks in gray are sharks that didn't have size recorded. Um, the juveniles and neonates start to show up in May. They really peak in June, and May and June is the bull shark pupping season in both uh, Gulf Coast nursery habitats and Florida nursery habitats. Um, and then by about August and uh, early September, the juveniles have started to clear out. Um, we do still have some adults and some unmeasured sharks that are caught all the way into October. Um, so this is kind of a reiteration of some of the, uh, the data before. Um, this is the same generalized linear model idea, looking at abundance, how many bull sharks were caught, and then presence, was there a bull shark in that set or not. Um, and for uh, both abundance and presence, year was a huge factor in whether or not you're going to catch a bull shark. Um, obviously from that graph, if it's prior to 2011, there are very few bull sharks even in the data set. Um, temperature and salinity uh, were both important. And then inlet distance was important to abundance um, and was also significant for presence. Um, but again, because salinity and inlet distance kind of vary the same way all the time, um, we ended up deciding to use temperature and salinity for the, uh, the future modeling. Um, so since we picked these two factors out as to, uh, you know, or as to whether or not they're actually important in determining whether or not a bull shark is going to be in the system, um, we then wanted to see whether or not those two factors have changed over time. Since we have such like a, it looks like there's a threshold crossed where you start regularly catching bull sharks. Um, so for temperature, uh, we have actually kind of an interesting story. I'd love to be able to tell you, oh, it's definitely going up all year round. But it's actually, it varies by month. Um, so May has significant increases in temperature, as do July. And then August, weirdly enough, actually has uh, decreases in temperature from 2007 to 2013. So our Mays and our Julys are getting hotter, but our Augusts are getting colder. Um, I have no explanation for that. Um, and then June kind of wobbles around and uh, doesn't really have a significant trend over time. Um, 
I wanted to try to, uh, to verify this with other sources of data. So I looked at uh, the temperatures from um, the NOAA data buoys, and the closest one to where the bull sharks were caught was in uh, Oregon Inlet. And that's actually well positioned the way that water flows through Pamlico Sound. That data buoy is actually picking up um, the water that's flushing out of Pamlico Sound for the most part. So it's a pretty good indicator of what's going on in the sound. And uh, that data buoy actually sh uh, had a data set that went back to 2005, and the temperatures um, in the water actually increased 4.38 degrees Celsius from 2005 to uh, 2014. Um, so that's a pretty big increase. Um, salinity, bull sharks like low salinity, and actually uh, while this temperature has been rising, um, the summertime salinities have also been lowering. Um, May, we don't really have a long-term trend, but uh, it looks like June we have reductions in salinity, um, July we have significant reductions in salinity, and then August we have significant reductions in salinity. Um, so we're not only getting increases in temperature, we're also getting probably rainier summers um, as time goes on, and that's actually causing more fresh water to enter the system. Um, so, uh, you know, we can't really make any hardcore conclusions from this until we get a little bit more data, but we can have a discussion about it. Um, so it looks like from here we can hypothesize that juvenile bull shark presence is driven primarily by temperature and salinity in Pamlico Sound, and this matches well with uh, what uh, factors drive bull shark presence in other nursery habitats as well. Um, the hypothesis that I'm starting to work with is that temperature drives whether or not these bull shark pups show up. And because we're getting these pups in May and early June, around the time they'd be pupping elsewhere, it doesn't make a lot of sense that they were pupped in Florida and then in a span of like a week, swam all the way up the East Coast to come up to Pamlico Sound for some completely unknown reason. Um, and, uh, you know, temperatures since 2010 have actually gotten to the point where the mean temperatures in Pamlico Sound in May and June are starting to look a lot like the temperatures in May and June in Indian River Lagoon in Florida. Um, so you're starting to get some real temperature overlap between those systems. Um, so what it's looking like is that because of these in increases in temperature and the lowered salinities probably also play a role, um, Pamlico Sound may represent a new nursery habitat for bull sharks. Um, but again, I would love to get into some more long-term data and get some observations from other people who've been out there. Um, so moving into the future, uh, we're also conducting an inshore shark survey in uh, back and core sounds. These are much smaller systems south of Pamlico Sound. Slightly different um, shark community. We get more black-nosed shark and bonnet heads down there. Um, and what we're really looking for there is uh, you can get access to a lot of different uh, fine-scale habitats, things like individual oyster reefs or seagrass beds or deep channels, um, and even just bare sand patches. Um, and what we want to do is use a combination of uh, fishery independent surveys and actually a small scale acoustic array um, to see how often sharks are using each individual habitat type. So now that we uh, have some evidence that sharks are maybe keying in on uh, seagrass and some other habitat types, we want to see how often that happens. Uh, we want to be able to measure how often a shark can be expected to, uh, to visit things like an oyster reef or seagrass. Um, I also want to incorporate 2014 data into the Pamlico Sound habitat mapping. Um, we've got a pretty robust data set right now, but you know, it's, there's always the possibility that we'll have a weird year that throws everything off. Um, so with 2014, we'll have about eight years in that data set, and I can start getting a little more confident in it. Um, we can also use the shark catchers from 2014 to see how many of them fall within the, uh, our actual habitat maps. Um, also using that, that habitat mapping technique to determine the potential for uh, interaction with other species. Um, are these predators kind of interaction, interacting with other kind of commercially and recreationally important species in uh, Pamlico Sound? I'm actually working with Tyler Peacock, another graduate student at ECU, on uh, answering this question specifically for red drum. We want to see how often bull, black tip, and sharp nose sharks are overlapping with adult-sized red drum. Um, and then finally, perhaps most importantly, I alluded before the importance of talking with fishermen. Uh, they're out there all the time um, in conditions that, frankly, I'm not usually legally allowed to bring ECU's boats into. Um, and uh, obviously, I have way more days at sea than, uh, than I can convince ECU to pay me to take. Um, so basically, they're able to go out there and get information that uh, I'm not able to. Um, so I would love to be able to interview fishermen, uh, especially down here around the Outer Banks where some of the more uh, productive shark habitats are, um, and get their input on this um, and basically use their knowledge as another way of determining where some of these shark habitats might be.
And, uh, you know, a project this big and sprawling, um, you know, they say it takes a village. This one probably takes a small city. Um, so I've had plenty of help from uh, colleagues at ECU. Um, Chris Hegman and his mates on the, uh, the fishing vessel Bout Time have been tremendously helpful for the tagging effort. Um, ECU diving and water safety, these divers that uh, risk life and limb to get our receivers back out of the water. Uh, the ACT network, these are people that have sent me uh, the data for when my sandbar sharks show up in their uh, backyards. And finally, uh, North Carolina Division of Marine Fisheries, people who have uh, been sharing data from, with me. Um, and obviously all the gillnet and longline survey crews. I usually prefer to do my own field work, so uh, I definitely appreciate their efforts. Um, and then finally, uh, all these organizations for either allowing me to uh, use their data or use their areas or just invite me to come talk. Um, and with that, I will take any questions.